And then with my other hat on, with my company hat on, I am, uh, as Kakshul says, I am director of airflow engineering at astronomer.io. Um, I run the team of 10 or so um, developers working on the open source project. Um, before I get any further, um, I'd like to kind of remind everyone that we are running our sort of annual Airflow user survey. Um, so if you want to have a say in what we should work on, what Airflow should focus on, and kind of what things we should add, uh, go to this URL and fill out, fill out our user survey. Um, I'll leave that up for just a second. It's bit.ly slash Airflow Survey 22, capital A, capital S. Um, don't do it now because otherwise you should clearly be listening to me. But anyway, um, so what am I going to talk about today? Dynamic DAGs um, and all the hacks we had to do to actually make them work at any kind of scale. Um, just that sort of, you know, here's the things we did and we didn't like, but they did it so we could actually do our jobs. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what we did in AIP 38. No, 42, wrong number. Numbers not important. <laughs> uh, too many, F AIP stands for Airflow Improvement Proposal. Um, it's basically any kind of big architectural change or fundamental change to Airflow. We go through an improvement proposal on the mailing list on the community going, hey, we're going to build this thing. Um, so yes, the, the dynamic task mapping, as we called it. Um, it's the same old Airflow, but it's a lot more powerful. Um, and then I'll go in a little bit, kind of high level into how we built it, what it, what it does, what it doesn't do, things like that. So dynamic DAGs, um, or as I like to call it, hacks on top of hacks, um, because it had all sorts of problems. So to wind back a little bit, let's say you are trying to, you have a list of, you know, you've got some files arriving into an S3 bucket, and the number changes over time. One week you might have 10, the next week you might have 3,000. And you want to do the same thing on each file. Um, so how, did, how does you solve this problem with Airflow before? Um, so one way would you kind of just pick a number and say, I'm going to create 10 tasks and each task is going to process one file and I don't know, a bit of hacks. Um, you have to pick the problem with this one. You had to kind of like pick your parallelism in advance. So if, if, if the number changes wildly, your DAG doesn't adapt and it will be slow one week, fast the next. Um, not to mention it's a hard amount of code. Um, don't try and read it. It's purposely small. Um, but that, that's the, 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 uh, the example here. Um, you have a for loop in your DAG file and just go like, hey, run some tasks. And then a little bit of a custom, this is a custom operator. And it goes, well, I am the end of task, so I'll pick the end file. Um, which, yeah, it worked. But you had to maintain a lot, all of this yourself. So not great at all. Um, the next way, you do that, but you do it in your DAG file directly rather than kind of at runtime, uh, which is great for kind of the slowly evolving DAG that kind of airflow was known for, but I don't like that pattern. I don't like having to rely on that pattern. Um, not to mention in this particular case, it's very easy to get it wrong and to have your DAG just like run out your run out one of your time timeouts and just not pause and not show up. And yeah, it's you know, it worked okay ish. But again, don't want to rely rely on that. So this one's a lot easier to be honest. A lot, a lot less code there. Um, the key bit there being you load from a variable and then you do a for loop over your variable. So this is good for, you know, I've got a number of clients and we add a new client every six months or so. So making changes is not too bad. Uh, another option, which is kind of this gives you, this doesn't have the paral parallelism drawbacks. You can run as many as you want. Just use a trigger bag run operator and then a sensor to kind of collect them all at the end and make sure they all finish. It works, parallelism solves, but you then can't see what's actually going on in your task. If one fails, you've got to click over here and click. And it's, you know, it's kind of an operational burden at that point. Um, so it's, you know, it was kind of pick your poison. Which one of these is right for you? Which one does work? Which one, which drawbacks can't you accept? So, yeah. Well, the other option, just live with it being slow. Um, I mean, if you've got five or 10, that's fine. We'll just do one and then the other and the other. Um, but if you've got a thousand, that's just not going to cut it. So, you know, it worked. These all sort of worked, but they weren't very nice. And then there was the just throw money at the problem kind of solution, um, which is where you just go like, hey, Spark, go process these, which is great if you're a Spark shop or you've already got an EMR cluster or Spark cluster up and running. 
But if you're not, then doing this is serious overkill, uh, not to mention very costly in terms of just like runtime. So dynamic task mapping. Your DAGs can now dynamically size themselves to fit the data. No, no more having to make these trade-offs and work out which parallelism is right or which thing. You can just go like, hey, Airflow, do this for me, work out how many, and use the existing concurrency controls to make it work. So setting the scene a little bit. Uh, about almost exactly a year ago, in fact, at Airflow Summit 2021, uh, myself and Ajamal gave a talk about uh, Apache Airflow 2.2 and beyond. And one of the things I mentioned there was this. Um, to kind of like this, this was my idea then of what dynamic task mapping would like, look like. So you have you know, my operator dot partial some parameters dot map. So that's what I said a year ago. It's changed slightly. Um, same idea, we changed the name because uh, two hard problems, naming thing, cache invalidation, and off by one apps. Um, so simple example, operator.expand. What this will do is this will, the scheduler of Airflow will look at whatever your iterable is, and it will create n copies of this task. We call them mapped task instances. Um, each one runs independently, each one has its own log, its own status, but Airflow can handle the, well, I want 100 of them this week and one of them next week. Um, so there's two parts to this interface. There's expand, which is like the equivalent of dot .map in Python, or map in Python, not dot .map. Um, but because mostly for implementation reasons, the order has to be kind of inverse to Python. So we decided to, to change the name slightly, and it's like expand, like you know, expand this task out across those things. The other thing you can do is dot .partial. So some of your arguments will be dynamic and change at runtime, but some of them will be fixed. Um, so dot partial is where you put anything that A doesn't change. So you know, it's, I always want one of this, one of them, I always want this image, I always want this config, or um, anything that belongs to base operator. So right now that means you can't map things like queue or pool. Um, some of those because the scheduler needs that to, before it expands it. Some of them because that's just how it's done and we could be changed. But for simplicity, if it's an argument to base operator, you can't expand it. So enough of the boring kind of simple examples. Um, let's take a real example. So um, back in my, at this point, dis distant past when I was um, a data engineer, a problem we had, and I should probably up prefix, prefix that with um, a lot of a lot of the things here. It's like this is something that I've been wanting to solve in Airflow since I first started using Airflow in 2017, um, and I finally managed to convince enough people that it was now was the time to do it, um, so I can scratch the itch that I don't have anymore because I develop Airflow full time instead. But um, so. We were working for a data company, uh, a data company in advertising, and each week we would get a bunch of CSV files, um, and we were, you know, wanted to process them and stuff, and convert them to a more easy to query format. So we would send them into JSON, um, and then you know, S3 select or Athena or something like that. Um, and yeah, that kind of as I said, like we didn't know how many files were going to arrive, so it was usually about three hundred. But sometimes it would be 20, sometimes it would be like 3,000. I don't know what that data supplier was doing, but it was wildly variable. So yeah, we just kind of had to, had to live with it being imperfect. But here's a real worked example. Um, this, this works. This will do what I said. So to kind of highlight a few bits, there's two tasks here. The first one is called Git Inputs. And it simply lists the files in an S3 bucket um, with kind of a prefix here. So data provider A and then a date, date interval. Um, you know, and however many files that returns, Airflow will go and create that many tasks, copies of the next task. Um, so here we go, we've got CSV to JSON. Um, 
And yes, here we go. Perfect example of static parameters being the input bucket. That's the same for every file. But the path, the, the object key, uh, gets expanded. Um, so I can, yeah, kind of like the, the examples of what it's doing inside the CSV to JSON, it's not all that interesting to this example. But um, here we go. So this feature, um, to slightly blow my own trumpet, um, FO2.3, which is when it was released at the end of April with this, um, is just so much more powerful than Airflow 110. So if you are still on Airflow 110, you owe it to yourself and your company to upgrade. Um, please, please upgrade. <laughs> Not just for this, but just so that um, we don't have to support Airflow 110 anymore. Um, that's me with my company hat on. Um, but yes. So how does this look in the UI? Um, I'm sorry, this is probably going to be a little bit small. But um, a member of my team, Brent, has built um, this wonderful new grid view. So the tree view that you have uh, know and maybe hated um, has disappeared and been replaced with the new grid view, which has support for task mapping. Um, uh, it's, I mean, it's such a good UI that a um, kind of multi-billion dollar company used that as inspiration for their new UI. Um, if you don't know what I mean, come grab me in the pub and I will tell you, but that's not going on stream. Um, but yes, um, so here you can see an example of a map task. Um, I should have had a blown up on this, sorry. Um, on the kind of right hand side, the bottom I should say, you've got a status for each of the tasks. You have the duration of your grid views and stuff. So it's kind of like, it was the tree view without the dependency stuff, which very quickly got out of, out of hand and you kind of end up with a big long cascading thing and just like didn't work. So yeah, um, Brent's done a wonderful job on, the, on this UI and we're slowly going to add more and more things to it. So we'll start adding bits of the graph view to this. We will start pulling logs directly into here. So it's not, again, making Airflow's UI up to date, let's say, um, rather than lots of kind of clicks and page refreshes and stuff. We'll start adding more things into this React view. But yes, it's very good. Um, I just kind of rethought about the information architecture and what people actually want to get from this view. So. So um, I showed you a simple, uh, a real example. And the last thing to do is to talk about, um, and the slide says it, I'm gonna read the slide. Um, it's a toy example, but it's a real effect. So cross product. So you can map, expand over multiple arguments. Um, we had to pick which direction to go. There are basically two ways to do this. There's either zip or there's cross product. So zip um, in the kind of Python, Python built-in, it's a tool, so I can't remember which it is. I think built-in, there's a zip function. You give it two lists and it gives you pairs from each one in, in turn. Um, and then the other option is it's a tools dot cross product probably, um, which gives you the first one, and it, well, gives you this. Um, so this is the mode we picked because this is kind of the, Mostly because we had to pick something. Um, so we picked this one because there are, other, there are other ways of getting a zip right now. The syntax or the way you do it might be imperfect. But we can add a nicer way of doing it on top, whereas kind of there's no other way of doing this. So this is the default. And then for now, zip's a bit hard and we'll make it easier in the future. Um, so yes, you take the first one from one list, all from the other list. The next one from the next list, all of them to the other list. So kind of below in the example, you can see it's like A1, B4, B5, B6, A2, B4, B5, B6 kind of thing. Um, so going back to this example, those of you with a very quick mental arithmetic will be able to work out that returns 90. Um, so it's yes, take these two lists, multiply them together, and then sum up everything. Um, trust me, I keep don't, but you know, I ran it, it gives you 90. Um, cool. So, um, on to the architecture, how we did a kind of, kind of, kind of section of the talk. Um, so first off, what can you map over? What can you use as an expansion source? Right now it's three things. So the simple example is a list or a dictionary. Um, 
this is kind of, it's literally in your DAG file, or perhaps more usefully, a more realistic example is you have a function that say reads a YAML file and returns this dictionary. Um, the cases for having like, as I was showing on the slides here, why you, you wouldn't do this. This is kind of a toy example, but you can have a pass an actual dictionary or actual list to um, expand as a, as a keyword argument. Um, if you pass a, a, so at runtime, when it's called, when your task is called, if you gave it a list, you will get an individual item as the argument. If it, if you give it a dictionary, you will get given a, uh, you'll get a tuple, tuple, a name, a key value pair. Um, the other thing you can list and the most kind of useful example um, is a kind of the result of a task or operator. So this and the next one are actually kind of the same thing. Um, the task flow API, which is the kind of the at task decorator on functions, the return value of calling that is a thing called an XCOM arg, which is kind of like it's a forward reference or a kind of a reference to, a, to an XCOM value pushed in the XCOM. So again, I'm just going to jump back and forth a bit. Down at the bottom here, we have A equals function call of A. So A is a task flow function. It returns this XCOM arg value. Um, and then at runtime, the scheduler knows, oh, I, this, this is thing, I'll go look it up in its meta store about how many to create. The other thing you can do is I've only shown it so far with examples of the task flow API, but you can um, map over the return XCOM pushed by a classic operator. Right now, to do this, you have to manually create the XCOM argument. Um, it's clunky. It's got its drawbacks. We might fix it. We might decide that kind of classic operators are classic and just say, I don't know. Uh, draw, drawbacks on that. Um, but yes, right now, these are the three different four um, things that you can map over. Um, a list or a dictionary, and then an XCOM argument either created for you automatically by the task API, or one that you as a DAG author created for yourself for your classic operators. Um, so you could have used, rather than my example where I called the S3 hook and returned a list of files, you can use the S3 list sensor, which pushes the things into XCOM, and you can do it that way. Um, kind of one gotcha of this one. Um, expansion only happens at the top level. Um, so if you look at this first example here, where I have bash command equals an array of echo and then some commands, that won't do what you hope, at least what you expect in the concept of this talk. Um, that will result in one task, and you'll get some weird string value for the uh, what your echo be like x comma arg with you know it's a rep Python str stringified object, which is not what you want. Um, so yes, the expansion only happens at the top level. This does lead to a few weird quirks right now. Um, one thing we might add, I say might because we haven't decided if we're going to or not is a way to more classical map. So it's like, yeah, um, hopefully you can kind of like see that this is the example. This is the top example of how it might look with this new thing. So XCOM will have a map. Um, and yeah, you can then like transform easier without having a whole task just to do the transformation that would you know, spin up a task, do some very simple transformations, run for less than a second and shut down. Why, why need to do, why have a separate task to do that when we could do it natively whenever we need it. So we might add this in 2.4. Um, I think it's a good idea. The question is whether we get around to it in 2.4 or not. <sighs> cool. That was the what. Um, where? Where does the expansion happen? Um, as late as possible? and as far away from the scheduler as possible. Um, so when a task finishes, um, brief segue into the kind of architecture of how Airflow runs its task. Whenever Airflow launches a task, it kind of goes from the scheduler to the executor. And then the executor has, we call it local task job, which is effectively kind of like a task supervisor or a process supervisor. And then you've got the actual task itself. 
So the task runs, it does its completion, it writes to the database, the database and says, yes, I was a success or a failure or things like that. And the, the kind of that extra process in the middle, the task supervisor, the local task job, um, at the end of the task, um, as a kind of optimization, we do a mini scheduler run there of essentially, I know this task just finishes, fit just finished. Let me look at the downstreams of it and see what else I can run. Rather than have to wait for the scheduler to come around and look at the DAG, it's kind of like, we've just finished. Something's probably schedulable now, so let's look at it. So that's the first place and the preferred place where this uh, mapping expansion happens. However, it doesn't always run. Sometimes the container crashes. Sometimes something goes wrong and you get a database timeout. So it's not reliable. We can't assume that it has happened. We want it to because it's kind of distributing the load, but it might not happen. So there's still a kind of expansion of last resort or a fallback in the scheduler itself. Um, but we don't want that to happen. We, we want that to happen as little as possible because obviously the, the core scheduler loop is busy. And if it's doing this expansion, then it's not scheduling other things. So let's try and make it happen as little as possible in there. Um, and then the, the kind of static expansions where you have like literals, like given an object or a dictionary, not one of these XCOM arg values, um, those are expanded at dag run creation time. Um, so basically it's like, you know, we know up front. We don't need to wait to know that this list is always going to contain three because it's a list. It's always going to contain three. So we do that one when we're creating the dag run. When does the expansion happen? as late as possible, as I was saying, kind of just in time. Um, I've already said it. Um, the last question is how? Uh, how did we do this? Uh, well, it took about seven months. Um, and a team of like, well, it started with two of us and then it was seven of us. But um, so we had a couple of goals when we we're trying to do this. Um, one of the things that was quite, I felt quite strongly about is to push errors as early as possible. Um, this is a new feature. It's got lots of things that people might expect, but it just doesn't work right. So um, wherever possible, we wanted errors to happen at parse time. So you get like a DAG import error going like, you can't do this. You can't map this kind of thing. It doesn't work that way. Um, not always possible because sometimes you can't tell until later. Um, but yes, it's trying to make, make the make the errors show up in the kind of import error rather than having to go like, oh, this task failed or drill down and and um, yeah, have to look at task log. That, that's kind of not what we want. Um, there was one case, one big case where that wasn't possible, which is um, come back to that. Never mind. Um, the other thing, the next thing, yes, kind of. We don't want every, every user to have to pay this cost, you know, a performance cost for if you're not using map task, if you just want airflow and you're happy with how it worked, it shouldn't be any slower. Um, and then the last one is kind of like, we wanted this to feel as Pythonic as possible and kind of as natural as possible. Um, when we were first writing this and kind of prototyping, proto prototyping the API, like the DAG authoring interface, um, kind of came up with an interface where you could, could actually do this with a for loop. Um, it was a special kind of object, and it, it worked, but it was very easy to bust into the limitations of, oh, this is a folder. I'll put an if here, and, and it, it's like, no, okay, let's slim it down. Let's give you a very defined interface, so that it hopefully still feels Pythonic. Um, which, if you're like me and develop Python all day, is great because I love Python, but with hopefully no foot guns. But yeah, you know, that's for I guess kind of you all to tell me whether I succeeded in that one or not. Um, so how did we actually do it? Um, so there's a new table um, added in 2.3, which we call task map. Um, so if you're at all familiar with the schema of Airflow, the kind of the underlying database tables. One of the primary, primary tables is the task instance table, um, which among other things has DAG ID, run ID, task ID. Um, 
and that was its primary key. Uh, but unfortunately, we now have to add another one. So we now have a lovely four column composite primary key. Uh, in hindsight, a mistake that we should have fixed a long time ago, but you know, hindsight's wonderful. Uh, so the task map table, again, kind of harping back to one of the previous points about not wanting to pay this cost, um, and particularly the scheduler when it's doing task mapping to not have a, not be slow and oh, a task a map task is really slow to work on. Um, with custom XCOM backends added in 2.1, let's say probably was to be honest. Um, you can now store gigabytes of you know gigabytes or even maybe terabytes of, of data in a data set on S3. And if the scheduler had to pull that down to work out how many items to expand over, that would kill your scheduling. It would like pull all the data down and throw most of it away. Um, so when the upstream tasks, the one that's generating the map list, if, um, back in my first example, it was the one that was doing the S3 list. Um, when that pushes a value into XCOM, it checks itself and goes like, am I, is, is one of my downstreams mapped? Yes, it is. I will write a new task map table saying how many. So um, kind of, we've already got it in the client there. It can do a length very quickly. It doesn't have to fetch anything down because it's already got it. Um, so we write it and pre-compute it there. Um, that reminds me, one of the cases where we couldn't surface the error late. If a uh, kind of a generating task doesn't return a acceptable value, by which I mean if it's something that's not a list or a dictionary, maybe a tuple, but you know an iterable of some form, that task will fail, and the whole DAG will fail. So basically, if if your mapped task tries to map over a date time object, well, that doesn't make sense. You can't iterate over a date time. So like that's the that's the one case where this is a runtime error, not a parse time error. But the big one that people are like likely to hit anyway. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, we added map index to task instance. We had to add it to all its related fields um, and the UI and the URLs, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I guess this is just kind of a, a, a caveat. If you are grubbing around in Airflow's database, be warned there is now a new primary key and uh, DAG ID, run ID, task ID is no longer necessarily unique. Um, but you shouldn't be listening. You shouldn't be messing around in other apps databases anyway, not without expecting this kind of stuff. Um, and to avoid you DDoSing your own Airflow cluster, there is a configurable limit placed on the number of expansions that Airflow will create. By default, I think the limit is 2K, 2048. It's picked entirely arbitrarily just so that you don't mistakenly have like two big lists and do a cross product and end up with millions of rows and then that DAG just takes forever to run. Um, you can up it if you want. There's no problem with it. It's just a, do you know what you're doing? Did you actually want to do this? Great, up the limit. Otherwise, it's just like, yeah, you probably didn't want to do that. That's a mistake. Um, so yeah, um, this was a big change. As I said, it took seven months, seven people. Um, and I think this was a bigger change than making the scheduler HA compatible. Um, it involved touching a good chunk of the Airflow core. Um, yes. Uh, a lot of back and forth, working out the right interface and things like that. Um, kind of, yes, it wasn't just me. It was kind of uh, my team as astronomer. So myself, Brent, Daniel Standish, Ephraim, Norm, uh, T.P. Chung, and also, kind of ha happily for me, someone else from the community kind of fixed fix some of our bugs, which was great. So that's um, Tan LK. Um, yes. Um, ah, I am wonderfully ahead of time. Whoops. Um, so yes, if you have any questions, now's the time to start asking them because I have less time, less slides than I thought. Cool. Uh, and a big thank you to. Uh, Matrix man at your service, um, Matt Rixman. Um, hate the guy, love him. Um, he kept breaking my code, which is exactly what you want in someone uh, in a QA engineer. But uh, yes, um, I think we would be in a lot rougher shape without him. So very glad that he was there to break all my code. Thank you, Matt. Um, we haven't finished. We decided it was good enough. Um, no software is ever perfect. Far from it. And if you try and make it perfect, you're never going to release it. So it's like, this works. This is useful. Let's get this out. Let's get this in front of users. And you can tell us what we got wrong. What doesn't make sense? 
what need better docs? What no one uses? Um, some things that we know about, uh, kind of the big one, as I was saying, like zip rather than cross product. Um, we knew that, like we knew when we were designing this that people would want zip. I wanted zip, but it was like, we have to pick one. Let's get this one. There are a few, there's some clunky ways around it. If you look at that, that issue, which is 23803. Don't believe that number. That may be wrong. Um, might be 23603, whatever. Um, there's a couple of workarounds in there if you really need zip right now, but we'll probably, we'll try and add a native way of getting zip into 2.4. Um, expanding task groups. Um, right now the expansion is at the operator, the task level. Um, and that's kind of the depth first versus breadth first. And depending on who you are, it depends on which way it is. But either do you run all of one, if you have a chain of maps tasks, do you run all of task A, all of its things, then all of task B, then all of task C, or do you run task A0, B0, C0 in parallel? So it's kind of like, what's your synchronization primit primitives? If you think of it in terms of like control points or like semaphore points, which one do you want? Um, when we were designing this and talking about the, the AAP, kind of the voting process, we had mapped task groups in there or expanding task groups um, under kind of breadth first or depth first. And we got most of the code written, but we couldn't work out the right interface. Um, so in the sake of getting something usable out, again, we, we postponed it. We can like cut it out. Um, the actual, yes, it's like the, the mapping of task groups was all done and working. We just kind of removed it from the interface, but it's the, what should the exact behavior be? Um, so we need to kind of think about that and work out what it is. So we'll have to add that in. Um, yeah, new expansion sources. Um, kind of being able to expand it over a variable would probably be a good one. Um, I think it was the, my second example of how not to do it was using a variable, um, which again is kind of like perfect for these slowly changing things, but we shouldn't have to pull the variable at the start because that's, that, that's code at the top level of a DAG. One of the things that kind of Airflows says to avoid is avoid code that's outside of an execute function. It's slower. It means extra database connections, all sorts of things like that. That yes, Airflow can work around it and optimize it, but if you don't need to do it at the top, why bother doing it? Um, so we'll add, you know, we should find some way of doing like a variable reference that's not evaluated until you need it, and the scheduler can do it, and things like that. Um, DAG params. Um, this would be a a good one. So it's one of the lesser known features of Airflow. You can have I'm trying to think how to say it. Um, on the DAG, there is a parameter you can add called params, an argument called params. Um, and when you trigger a DAG, either through the UI or through the CLI, you can give it a JSON blob. Um, and since 2.2, .2, you can now validate the params, like give it a JSON schema and give it type and stuff. Um, being able to map map over expand over those would be good, useful. Um, for instance, maybe you want to give it, hey, here's a list of uh, hyper tuning parameter sets, and go like, here's five different sets. Please go run them all. Um, so that would definitely be another one of. You can do all the. There, there are ways around doing all these. Like you could the variable example. You can just put it in a task that gets a variable and returns it, um, which is how I say to do it for now. But let's make it more native, make it easier to do what you want rather than, oh, I need to wrap that in a task to do this one thing that's actually not very difficult. Um, and yes, the other one is right now, a, a source can only go to a single parameter. So A equals A, B equals B. You can't kind of do the star, star quarks style of kind of like, hey, expand this into multiple parameters and I'll just kind of control it. Um, it's easy to say. I don't know how we're going to implement it or what the interface will be like, but I think that would be a great one to add. So, um, yeah, if you if you kind of have any ideas about any of these, try us out. Help us design an interface that makes sense to a DAG author. We'll work out how to write it, but if you tell us what makes sense to you as DAG authors, um, that's the uh, the thing where we need help. Because, um, yes, when we're so close to the code, it's like, of course it makes sense. Well, I know what it does on this side and that side. So, But, yeah, if you only see this side, maybe it doesn't make sense. Um, and of course, it wouldn't be a conference talk 
without saying that we're hiring because which company is not hiring these days? Um, but more seriously, um, if you want to come work on cool things like this, um, speak to us. We are hiring. We have lots of roles, engineering, sales, DevRel, data. Um, yes, there we go. Uh, we now have time for questions, which is about eh, eight minutes early. <laughs>